Welcome to In Your Neighborhood. I'm your host, Chris O'Rourke. We're coming to you from the great outdoors where we're about a month away from the start of spring. It's this transition period from cold to warm that creates perfect conditions to tap a treasure from many of these trees. It's called maple sugaring, and John Beam's gonna join us now to take us from start to finish through the process. Good morning, John. Good morning, Chris. Welcome to Montour Preserve Sugar Bush. Thanks for having us. So what are we doing here? The first step in maple sugar sugaring is? Tapping a tree. And how do we do and that? And it has to be a maple tree. It has to be a maple. Yes. A specific kind of maple tree? Well, we usually use sugar maples, but you can also tap red maple trees, which are predominant in this area also. Now, do different maple trees produce a different kind of sap for syrup? Sap is basically the same. The only difference is that sugar maples tend to have a higher percentage of sugar in their sap than red maples. That's why we prefer sugar maples. Okay, so we're gonna tap a tree. Yep. And is there a specific method to do it, a specific procedure? There is. Um, first of all, we have some equipment here that we need. We have a sap bucket. And I like to tell the kids you can tell a sap bucket because it has a hole here right under the rim. Okay. They give you one with a hole down here and it'll take it, it doesn't work. <laughs> There's a roof for the sap bucket, which okay. we'll use once we get the spile in place. The spile is a little metal tube that we're going to insert into a hole in the tree. Okay. And we need a way to make that hole, and that's a hand drill. Okay. Old fashioned brace and bit, which works just fine for our purposes and the kids love to use this. So the first thing we're gonna do is make a hole in the tree. We're gonna drill in about an inch and a half to two inches, and we've measured that and put a stopper on there. Okay. We drill at a slight slant uphill, and of course, to start the drill bit, you turn it to the right, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. So you wanna give it a try? Okay. Now, John, we've determined this right here is the spot we're gonna drill. Yep. Any particular reason why? That's a comfortable spot. We're away from old tap holes from previous years, which would not yield much sap, so that looks like a good spot to me. Now, you said an inch and a half to two inches. Is there any particular reason why we only go in that far? Is that a good, good length to go in? The spile is not gonna go in much deeper than that. We go in just a little bit beyond the spile so that sap can go into that hole and flow through the spile. We don't need to go in any deeper. Okay. Especially on smaller trees, if we went in too deep, we'd actually go into the heartwood where there is no sap. So a little slant uphill. There you go, very good. It's going in pretty easy. Now, is there a particular reason why this is a really good time of the year to do this? We're getting into a time when the temperatures usually fluctuate between freezing at night and above freezing during the daytime. Mm -hmm. And that's perfect for sap to flow. Actually, that's deep enough. I don't think the stopper is at the right place. So, are we not going to tap here? Yeah, we are going to tap Okay. Here. Now, I have a little somewhere here. We're just going to take this and get at any of the wood shavings out that's left behind. Usually use a nail, but a little Those would tend to swell up mm -hmm. and stop the hole. Now, we're not going to get any sap flow today because it is around freezing. Okay. But we'll have the bucket set and the, the spile set so that in a couple of days when the weather does warm up, the sap will start flowing. Is there an ideal temperature for when it starts flowing? Anything above freezing. Oh, okay. The warmer, the better. So how many years you been doing this, John? I've been uh, involved in maple sugaring here at Montour Preserve. This will be my 24th, 25th. Actually, 25th year. 25th year? Yes. Wow, quarter century. It's amazing. <laughs> and this is a very popular program, isn't it? It is. We have, we've had up to three, 4,000 people come to our programs, including school groups and the public to the open houses in the past. It's incredible. Okay, so this is the... That, that's a metal spile. Right. And what looks like a shark fin here goes up. Okay. This tapered end goes in the hole. So we got the pound. And you're going to need... A, hammer to tap it in place. Tap it, not pound it. That's right. <laughs> it has to be snug, but not too snug that we can't get it back out. So that, that's probably good. Okay. I tell the kid, if, kids if it wiggles, it's too loose, but it's nice and snug there. Okay. So the next thing you'll need will be a sap bucket. 
And you can probably figure out what that hole in the sap bucket is for. Okay. Am I doing this right? You're doing <laughs> it perfectly. Hooks over that shark fin. Roof goes on top to keep out rain and snow. Does it just slide yeah, on? Yeah, it can slide on, yep. There you go. And we're all good to go. And we're good to go. This was the first of four trees I would tap last week. John told us that they planned on tapping 20 just to get the sap flowing and the process underway before the Montour Area Recreation Commission begins hosting school groups. They'll also have open houses on February 27th and March 6th. John says they'll show the students and anyone who comes to the open houses how to tap a tree and let them try, and through that process, they'll eventually tap 50 trees. One tap tree can produce about a pint of syrup, and if temperatures get between 40 and 50 degrees during the day, these buckets will be full in one day. It's truly a process that is at the mercy of the weather. As long as they get cold nights and warmer days, things will work perfectly. John had help on this day from volunteers Deb Staransky and Ken Mertz. We were soon calling Deb the tree whisperer as she explained to us that you look for the opposing branches to identify the maple tree and then make sure you avoid previously tapped spots. Hey, I'm feeling right oh, here. No. All, right. <laughs> All right. You agreed to that too easily. <laughs> you say, well, did we say south, south, east? This is facing north. Mm -hmm. So do we want it around the back side here? Um, Right up in here? Yeah. And even though the colder weather that day should have brought sap flow to a complete stop, we tapped several trees that ran for us right away, and some were gushing fluid as soon as the drill bit was pulled out. We also got a chance to taste the sap, which was a little thicker than water, with a slight sugary taste. Okay, John, it's a week later, and we're seeing what you said last week, which is that this is an operation which is very much at the mercy of the weather. Last week, very cold. Today, warm and rainy. So how's the sap flowed since we were here last? Well, fortunately, over the weekend, we had above freezing temperatures, and the sap was really flowing for at least two days. It's slowed down a little bit since then. But once again, this weekend, it's going to warm up again. We'll have some sunshine, it'll be above freezing, and the sap will be flowing pretty good again. So we, we were able to get 50 gallons of sap in the last four or five days. That's really good, isn't it? That's not bad from about 20 trees that we have tapped. Okay, so we have one here, so let's yes. go ahead and empty that. Do you need me to do anything? Go right ahead and okay. dump it for I'm us. I'm gonna jump right in here. Okay, so we have some here. And John, this is just since yesterday, right? Yesterday afternoon, yes. Okay, so, and you come out and empty it on a daily basis? Weather dependent, but yes. Okay, so here we go. Let's pour this into your collection bucket. Okay, get it back up here. And from what I heard, understand, this is one of the trees I tap. It is. And you can see it's dripping pretty good today. Right, so we picked a winner. We did. And now we see why they have the bucket covers to keep the extra water out. Our next stop in the process was to head to the collection tank. So this is the holding tank. It is. This is where we dump all the sap that we collect before it goes into the sugar shack where it gets boiled down. And it has so. a grate on top to catch any extracurriculars. Yes. Okay. We often get moths mm -hmm. I and see that. other insects in the sap. Okay, so here we go. Our small contribution. Excellent. So now we go to the boiler. Yep, the evaporator. The evaporator. I'll get the term right. Go right down this, I can take this. Okay, so we're inside the sugar shack, away from the rain, and we're at the evaporator with Ken Mertz, who's taken over for John now, because Ken has been working the evaporator for a number of years. How long uh, is that? This is number six. Number six, six years I've been helping here. Yeah. Okay, so we're at the holding tank. How does the, what's in the holding tank get in here? Uh, we have a three-quarter inch piper, a three-quarter inch copper tubing coming in from the holding tank. Uh, feeds in through the back of the building here. Comes in through plastic tubing over here and to a float, a valve. 
so we don't have to touch it really. Uh, as the evaporation occurs and as the water level goes down, the float drops and lets more sap oh, come in. Oh, interesting. Now, I noticed with the evaporator there are two sections. Is there a reason why? Yes. Down inside, which you can't see without looking in the door, down inside this half of the evaporator are a series of actually six fins, not uh, three, and they look something like this, only sealed on the end. So the sap is down between those. The flame goes up between those from underneath okay. and tremendously increases the evaporation process. Okay. This end is just flat bottom, so we can finish it off without scorching it. Oh, okay. All right, and uh, this is this is going at 700 degrees. Uh, we will probably push a little higher if we can. Okay. When we really get it going. And how long does it take from when it gets in here for it to evaporate into what you can use? Uh, if we, my glasses are steaming up. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems without having contacts. Uh, if we had 40 gallons out in the holding tank right. and ran it through here as as rapidly as we were able to run it through, we could probably run off 40 gallons in. Uh, six, eight hours, okay. something like that. Get one gallon of syrup. That's it. One, one gallon. gallon of syrup. Up here you see all these. Someone made these up years ago. There's 40 jugs hanging up here with the yellow one in the center. Uh -huh. And that represents the one gallon we get after we, after we evaporate all that water off. Wow. Uh, in, in, in an eight hour day from like maybe eight in the morning to four, five, six in the afternoon, we might be able to get two gallons of syrup off of here. So you're out here for six to eight hours a day for maybe a gallon or two of syrup. Right. Okay. Right. A lot of work. Yes, it is a lot of work. So how do you get it from here? How do you know when it's done, first off? Okay. Uh, this side of the tank, when we have school groups coming in, we'll try to keep this looking much like it does when it comes in from out. It looks a lot like water. Right. Then we will, this is out of place right now, but there is a plug that goes in here. And when we want to drain this from that tank over in here, we pull that plug and it drains over here by gravity. Okay. Then this side, this portion of the tank, we will heat longer and harder. If we were to get a sample of that and look at it, it would look like water. When we have this where we'd like to have it, it would look like light colored tea. Mm -hmm. Then we can pull this plug out and let it go over into there and cook it harder and longer over there and it'll look like dark colored tea, which is getting ready to, okay. to, uh, to put into bottles. Okay. One way we can tell is we have a, a large ladle and when we get over in this tank, we'll let it flow off the ladle and this is a, this was just started this morning, so you won't see this effect here. Right. But when it comes off of there and forms a, a layer, like a, it looks almost like a plastic film hanging on the bottom of the spoon, okay. that tells us, oh boy, you're close. That, that's, that's really good, that's yeah. really close. Then we have another device. This is an hydrometer, and it consists of a special piece of glass tubing with counterweights in the bottom and a scale on here. We dip what we think is the finished syrup into there, we put this down inside, and because the sugar content creates a denser liquid solution, it pushes up on this and causes it to float. When it floats with the red line right at the top of the liquid, mm -hmm. that says, okay, it's, it's, done. it's time to put it in the container and, and bottle it. So you use one of these taps to, to let it out. That one over there. That one over there, okay. yep. And, and we run it through, a, there's a filter there in the bucket, we run it through the filter to take out uh, gritty material that forms from the evaporation of the water, it lets mineral content behind. And that mineral content can taste kind of gritty on your pancakes, which really probably wouldn't be too good. It doesn't hurt you, it's minerals that your body can use, but it's gritty, so we filter that out right. with that filter. Okay, and then it's, it's ready to go then? And then it's ready to go, ready for the pancakes. <laughs> Ken told us they are able to measure the sugar content of the syrup, and while two is good and three is ideal, this year's batch is running at about 2.5. He also made up these signs to show visitors the nutrients you'll find in maple syrup, with manganese and zinc being the most prevalent. You'll also find out that Vermont makes up 41% of the maple syrup market in the United States, with Pennsylvania at just 4%. How much maple syrup do they make here at the Sugar Shack each year? Well, on average about 12 to 15 gallons. Where does it end up? In this little container right here where it is enjoyed each year by children in school groups and anyone who comes to the open house. A spoonful of golden delight. Any extra goes into next year's production. Unfortunately for us, they're not far enough along in the production this year so that we get a spoonful. If you have a story idea, email us at iwayan at or send us a message on Facebook. We'll see you next time.